Welcome to Two Girls in a Pod. I'm Sharon. I'm Christy. Hope all of you are doing well this week. I uh, hope it was a great week for you last week as well. So once again, you know, our morning little talks, we come up with these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so the one for this week was navigating the world when you are viewed as different. And I think a lot of people can sit there and say, oh my goodness, yeah, at some point in my life, I've really maybe experienced that, whether it was in school or on the playground or in college or in a relationship, it doesn't really matter. I think at some point, most people can view, may see themselves as different from a group or maybe even in their family system, you know, in their friend group at work. Have you ever had that? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I did in school when I was younger, too. I don't know. I just felt sort of, I don't know, square peg in a round hole, I guess. <laughs> I had friends, but I don't know. I just felt a little bit different. Did you feel that way too when going into high school? Because it was, you know, go from homeschooling and private school to... Oh my or... God. Yeah. Well, I went to private school up to fourth grade and then from fifth through eighth, I was in homeschool. And so then went into high school, full on public high school. In a big one graduating class of 400. And I know that a, a lot of people have bigger classes than that, but yeah. Wait, very different than mine, which was a little teeny tiny class. <laughs> yeah. I felt like a little fish though in a big pond because like I said, I had been, you know, just in private school and homeschool. Cause so that was just a complete turnaround for me. But it, so it was really hard for me to navigate that. And I didn't make a lot of friends in high school. I I had just a few that I talked with. I was fortunate in that there were people that I already knew that were attending the same school just through the church that I attended. And those were the main friendships that I had was through the church. So having them, some of them there at the high school, that helped a lot. And I think sometimes too, you know, if you're more introverted and stuff, so you're not really, it's not that you don't know how to communicate, but it's like you like your alone time and all of that. And so you can oftentimes be viewed as awkward or and when you're really not. And I think that that's what it was, is I think that other people viewed me as awkward because I felt awkward. And it wasn't that, I don't think I innately, I was an introvert, but I feel like that that was something created over time. And so that the shyness and that, it really made it difficult. But that's something I think that I just learned to believe about myself over time. And, and it's what made me feel different. Well, and I am once again, I think that happens for people in general. And some at some point in your life, you may feel like the odd one out. And it can be for so many different reasons, it really can. The reason I say that too, is because when I was little, little, I was more the kind that like to showboat, I guess you might say, because I love to sing commercials and just be in front of people and and dance and all kinds of things like that. And then just somewhere along the way, it started to change. And it's really interesting because those changes can happen when we don't even realize them. And sometimes the changes happen when we feel like we're the odd one out. Yeah. We actually put up more barriers and, and I don't know whether it's a protective thing or it doesn't really matter, but we start to change according to those environments or whatever that is. And, and then we start to feel out of place in the world. Yeah. You know, and then sometimes this is how you're born. You know, we've talked about this before. I work with a lot of people who are on the autism spectrum and, and, you know, what's one of mine told me last week, I don't understand my world right now. I don't understand because things have changed a little bit. So trying to navigate that And once again, we're not going to change the world. And I always tell them, the world's not going to change for you. But we have to figure out how do we help you fit in the world, find those little niches for them. Because, and it's not just autism, because there's a lot of non-neurotypical people that are not autistic, but are non-neurotypical for other reasons. And I think that that's the thing. And when the thought processes are a little bit different than how they engage with others, seems socially awkward. When you say non-neurotypical, I'm wondering, you know, how many people out there really understand exactly what that means? 
Well, that's a much better way than saying normal versus abnormal. Right. Because we're talking about what would be within a norm and what's without, without, you know, outside of a norm. But it just means it's not neurotypical. It's not like a neurotypical brain function. Non-neurotypical just means it's different. But it's neither good nor it's neither bad. There's no judgment on it. It's not normal or abnormal. It just simply is. You know, my job is to help them navigate this world, help them find where they fit in the world. Where they can feel good about themselves. Because I will constantly hear from them, I don't fit. Yeah. I don't have friends. I'm supposed to have friends because that's what society tells them. But they really don't want to have friends. But then they want to have friends. But then it's too much work to have friends. It's this big, <laughs> this big vicious cycle. <laughs> big deal. You know, it's very hard for them to figure out how to navigate that. And I mean, I feel like we navigate that in relationships and things like that anyway. You know, what looks, what's within the norm, what's with outside the norm. And there's so many things that we see that we're not the norm, become more of a norm. You know, it, it ebbs and flows and it's a societal thing. Yeah, it's what, whatever society says. So it's... Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what's really interesting is when we look back historically, what does that look like historically? And it changes when the mindset of society changes, the norms change. Yeah. Just like we were discussing about tattoos. Yes. That was a big thing. It used to be back in the day, if you had a tattoo, you were either a prisoner or a motorcycle rider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was no in between. You know what I mean? It was very stereotypical. Right. Now, when you look, there's so much more tattooing going on. And I think it's because it's become... I know for us, it represents something. I mean, I can go and buy a piece of art and put it on my wall. Mm -hmm. In this case, for us, truly, it is we are buying a piece of art. And we're just putting it on our bodies. Which I think is cool that people are starting to view it more that way. Because you're right, before it seemed like that if people had tattoos, they were thought of as sort of deviant or whatever. And now it's becoming more acceptable. And I think that it's really cool that that's the case. Because like you say, it truly is an art form. And I remember when it used to be that there were many, many jobs out there that you couldn't. I was thinking of your mom. She really did not like tattoos. Yeah. So it took a long time before I ever showed her my tattoo, but there were many, many jobs out there that you couldn't show tattoos at all. You had to cover everything up, but yeah. It's a little funny story because your mom hadn't seen it and we had gone back to see them. And so we had your little brother and he saw your tattoo and he pointed it out to your mom. <laughs> she made a comment like that wasn't a good tattoo. And your little brother, being a little kid, looked at and goes, but mom, it's two crosses. He saw the two women symbols as two crosses, which was a religious symbol. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the minds of children, you know, so he thought that then that had to make it a good thing and you should like that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> now, you know, we got a few more tattoos and your mom's a little bit different and... Yeah, that's fine. Even with my parents, I love them dearly. My dad and mom, they were not tattoo people. And I got my first tattoo. And I asked my dad, I says, Well, what do you think? And he kind of sits there and he's looking at it. And he tells me, Hita, if God wanted you to have tattoos, he would have made you have tattoos. And I sat there for a moment. And I said, You know what, Dad, if God wanted me to have clothes, I would have been born with clothes. I said, but I think people really appreciate that we wear clothes. And he kind of looked at me and he goes, you're right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't argue with that. You know, but it, it was just a different way of looking at it. It wasn't that my parents were against them. It just wasn't their thing. And remember, my parents were a little bit older. So it wasn't that they were really against it. It just wasn't something that they would have done. Right. So it's a little bit different. But Tattoos are a really big thing that are also, you know, one of those things that are, the, once again, we look at that social climate. But the thing is, as I always tell people, is only through awareness. When we make people aware of something, then we can start educating. Mm -hmm. Autism spectrum is one of those things. The more awareness we have, the more we can educate, the more we can do different things with it. Right. Well, and exactly. I mean, that's what creates the critical thinking about something to, you know, to change an idea in the world. It has to be brought into our awareness. The other thing, of course, you know, and a lot of people are talking about this is the LBGTQ plus community um, with the transgender, the pronouns and that's going on right now. And once again, if we talk about it, we bring awareness to it, then we can educate. 
when people ask me, well, you know, I'll, I'll have conversations about that. We just had one with our really good friend, uh, Colleen. And the thing is, is that it's being respectful. At the end of the day, we have to be respectful. Mm-hmm. Even if it's something you don't understand or you may not agree with or whatever, I don't think people are saying, be this. I think they're just saying, see me. And they want to be seen as not outside, as far as not being viewed as so different that they're not inclusive as well. Because I think people want to still have one foot in somewhere in society. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things we work on now. That's another area that I really work a lot with is the LBGTQ plus community and helping transgenders as they navigate this, not only what changes with their body, not with their mind, because their mind is already the other gender. Internally, it's the other gender. It's just getting the internal, the external to match. Right. But it's helping them navigate the people that they love the people they work with, all of those things. It's helping them navigate that piece of it about how can I truly embrace who I am and be accepted for who I am and at the same time not have to compromise that piece in order to feel inclusive right. or included in those kind of things. And I think that's a that's a really difficult and it can be a very difficult and be a very painful thing. Mm-hmm. But I also tell when I work with transgenders, I always remind them as well, this is something that's been with you all your life, whether you've talked about it or you haven't talked about it or whatever. And I say, if that's the case, because you have had that knowledge longer, when you talk to your parents or your family or your friends, whoever it is, and they don't understand it or they have a negative reaction, give them a moment, give them space, hold space for them for a minute to try to wrap their head around this. In that case, that's the norm for you, but it is not the norm for them. It's news to them. It is very much news to them. And I say, hold space for them for a minute. And I have seen this in my practice where uh, parents may have a negative reaction at first and then the next reaction. And then, and then you know, so it's, it's this progression until it's okay. And it might be, well, okay, you can be, okay, I get your transgender, but just be it at home. <laughs> don't be out there in public being that part of it is fear mm-hmm. and it's hard for the child to understand that's a parental fear a parent's job they feel is to take care and protect yeah and they get afraid that they can't protect you and so that's very scary but i also tell parents be gentle too. either choose to be along on this ride and if you don't want to if it's too much for you then get off the ride because don't be hurtful Mm -hmm. still be kind there is a way to be respectful in these things whether we understand them or not you know and i tell people it's not about and i understand and i tell people there's a process to it and right now it's trying to fit in whether once again whether it's on the spectrum whether it's gender sexuality it can be physical differences you know what we perceive as what i really love is you know, when we talk about the physical piece of it is Victoria's Secrets. They're changing their models. Yeah. As society changes, they're changing. They're trying to encompass other things. We can look at color. We're seeing more color, more people of different backgrounds being represented in things. Mm-hmm. So it's a bigger representation. Right. You know, when you talked about for you, for me, it was a real social... <laughs> It was truly a cultural something because I started out at Adams State University in my undergrad. My partner at the time couldn't get her degree there. So we transferred to Colorado State University and just want you to know, I love CSU. I am an alumni. I love that college. I love the education I got from them as I do at Adams State University. When I first got there, it was like a cultural thing for me. There were not people of color, and it, there were such a small percentage of people of color. It was kind of weird to me. Mm. I mean, I had the things to relate to as far as being in the psychology department because we shared that, but there was no color. It was very strange. And and I remember at first thinking, oh, my God, this is so – it just felt so different. It felt different. I felt out of place. Mm-hmm. I felt like I didn't fit. But CSU, you came through for me. Because I finally did. I came a part of El Centro. I, 
some of the minority stuff that was going on there. And it was truly a blessing for me. I thought it was so cool. You know, I got to the Colonel Kemmermeyer came and spoke with us. She was, if you don't know who she was, she is, uh, was the highest ranking in the army and came out and then got discharged in that. Candace Gingr- Gingridge, Gingr- I always love that name. Got to see that. So they would bring different people in. And so I could relate on that level, at least. So there were organizations, at least, that you yes. could get involved in. Yes. Fast forward, one of my colleagues, her daughter, who is half black and half white, but looks more black, went to CSU and a well, colleague friend, she came to me and she said, my daughter wants to, I said, tell her, tell her no. Because it was a cultural shock. When I talked to them, I said, it's going to be a little bit of a cultural shock. I says, but she's going to embrace it. She's going to love it. And yeah, fall uh, in October, she came back for a visit. And she tells the mom, I don't want to go back there. And she goes, no, you're going to go back. You're going to see. And she did. And now really fast forward, one of my clients that I had been seeing graduated high school and is now uh, attending CSU. And when she talks now, it's about all the organizations. It's about being involved. It's about how CSUs, they've also grown so much in with the minorities and stuff like that. So once again, kudos to CSU. And once again, it's an amazing college. I think that is what's cool is that because it is being brought into our awareness, there are maybe more organizations that people can get involved in and help with that feeling of being different or whatever, that there's some place for them to find a niche. And I think in higher education, you find that. Yeah. In most colleges today, you find those kind of groups. You find the ones for the Hispanic or Latinos. You find the one for the African-American Blacks. You find the ones for the Asians. You find the ones for the LBGTQ plus community the Muslims, the Jewish, I mean, it's just this wide Hindu, it doesn't, it's just this wide range. And I think you find those very inclusive things in there that help you to once again, then feel part of the bigger organizations. Right. So for me, that was one of those places that I really did feel, as you said, like the round peg in the square. (laughs) Yeah. It was just, did I say that backwards? I think so. (laughs) (laughs) But we got the gist. The reason I said that is because she's looking at me like, girl, you did not get that right. (laughs) A square peg in a round hole. (laughs) This is how I see things. See, once again, I'm a little odd. And I even tell her that sometimes when I'm talking and stuff, and and when I tell my clients, there's a method to my madness, I promise you. I think sometimes I know I think a little bit different. Yeah. But what's great about the way you think is that you're actually able to articulate it in a way that people understand it better. They get a a really good understanding. And I think that's probably because I can think like a (laughs) six-year-old, like a (laughs) 60-year-old, as people tell me. You're versatile. That's great. (laughs) Even with that, I think sometimes when, when we feel like our thought processes are a little bit different, that impacts how we feel like if we feel like we fit in. Yeah. You know, it's really funny because I think even like, I tell you, we have a lot of friends who are artists. I love artists because their thought process is so different. It's like they can see art in everything, man. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which is great. And, you know, we have some of the best conversations with our friend Colleen because she just can be so, because she sees it. I don't know if because of the art, they conceptualize things differently or, Mm -hmm. and sometimes you'll even see those people, not segregated, but those groupings. Right. When we would go and hang out with the theater people, they would hang out together because they felt like they fit together. Mm Mm-hmm. We were talking this morning, even regionally, you know, how sometimes a person from the East or West Coast, you know, they can move to Colorado and they're like, we love Colorado, but they don't quite feel like they fit. Mm -hmm. And then they go back to the East Coast or the West Coast and they feel like the mentality fix. Everything just matches up. Right. And I think that's what it is, is being aware in ourselves of where we feel like we're different or we're not fitting in and then ask ourselves, What is it about me that makes me feel that way? And if I'm not okay with it, then how do I address that? Mm -hmm. If I want to be or accept, (laughs) accept that you don't have to follow the norm. I had this conversation with my, uh, like he's young to me, he's a teen and he's on the autism spectrum and just really upset because I don't have friends 
and it's this area that we're trying trying to help him understand into bridge is that he wants to feel a part of. He really wants to feel that. But at the same time, the pull to just do what he does, to live in his world that makes sense to him. But it's trying to bridge that of what society is expecting of him, because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to college. You're supposed to get a job. You're supposed to make friends. You're supposed to have relationships. He's saying, how can I have a relationship? I don't even have a friendship. I don't don't have any of this. Right. But part of him doesn't want it. But there's that pressure. And we look at that societal pressure to fit in, to be a part of, to do this. But it's how do we help society also understand that there's multiple ways to fit in. It's not one size fits all. Right. How can we help shift that or at least help people feel okay in where they're at at that moment? And so that's my job with him is how do I help him understand that he can have success in different ways? Because his concept now is he think because of what society says, you know, he hears at the schools, you know, people want him to be successful, blah, 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 get a job. This is what you do. How does he learn to be okay with with some of his limitations? How does he learn to be okay with that and still find a place in this world where he's going to be okay? And thankfully, he has a therapist to help him do that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the thing, whether it's a therapist, a best friend, your spouse, your kids, whoever it is, finding those people that you trust that you can talk about these things with. When you don't feel like you fit in. Yeah. And if you don't have that person, seek the person out that you can have those conversations with. Several of my clients who will tell me, I don't feel like I fit in. I don't know where I fit in. I feel displaced sometimes. And then trying to figure out where did this come from? Why do they feel that? But then also having to make sure we understand, are they trying to fit into somebody else's definition of what they're supposed to be versus who they are exactly and i think that can be a real a real struggle sometimes well it can be because they may still be under that pressure even as like an adult maybe it's something you know it's like i told you i don't really feel like my true self is probably the shy person that i basically turned out to be as i aged but i feel like now i'm regaining my voice again and I feel like, though, that you can you can continue to buy into that. And maybe it's the influences around you that have made you believe that, but not necessarily that it's your authentic self. And I think that so much of the time when we're trying to fit in, we lose our authentic self because mm-hmm. and I always tell people, you have to look at that compromise. Is the compromise worth it? To give up our authentic self to fit in, it will create a dysregulation in us. It will keep us from being the optimal to optimize who we truly are. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something I would not compromise. I feel like it's something that no one should compromise, but I think that people do it a lot of the time without even realizing they are compromising. They have truly believed this about themselves. They think it's a behavior that's innate to them and, and maybe it is, maybe it's not, but I, you owe it to yourself to really find out who you are. What's interesting, you know, when I worked with kids, you know, I worked with schools and things like that. And and oftentimes when I would have those kids who are non neurotypical and and that struggle for them and, you know, teachers would think that they were being oppositional or they were doing being the uh, or defiant or they were being this and they were being that, not understanding that they, at that moment they were being their authentic self because they were they're just confused. And once again, the frustration level rising in not only the child, but in the staff and the staff wanting to, and because once again, they have more than one student they're dealing with. And I understand that, but it's how do we bridge that? How do we help them help the child embrace who they are? A few ADHD kids I've worked with too. And that's another thing, whether you believe in ADHD or you don't, all it means is that they're, they have a hard time with focus and concentration, call it whatever you want, but It was really interesting. I had this client I worked with. And one day he said, you know what? He goes, sometimes I wish I could go back and just kick my 14-year-old self in the butt. And I go, why? He goes, because I feel like I could have been more successful than I am at this moment. He says, but he said, I knew I had issues with 
being ADHD. He says, but I didn't push my parents. I didn't push anybody. I didn't even push myself. He said, if I knew back then what I know now, he said, I would have kicked him in the butt and I would have gotten on meds. He goes, cause now I'm on meds and he goes, I'm moving forward. He says, but I feel like that was a time that I could have even flourished more. Right. And he said, because I didn't want to believe I had ADHD. I didn't believe in ADHD. I didn't believe in medication and on and on and on. And even with that, I'm just there like, oh, it's whatever your belief is. I'm, I don't, it's neither right or wrong or this or that. Any, uh, you know, when we look at mental illness, you know, oftentimes I'll hear people say, well, that person really doesn't have this or they're just making that. I, you know what? Once again, be respectful. Right. We're not living those things, but people are trying to fit in. Mm-hmm. And we even talked about that. You know, one of the new trending things, if if you don't know on TikTok, is people getting on there and talking about mental illness and about having mental illness. And, and understand, I only learned this through my clients because they are a wealth of information for me. But they'll say, yeah, you know, this person is about ticks. And so we have more people with ticks. And it's not that the person has the ticks. It's very weird. But that trend now for people to have a mental illness. And one of my clients was talking to me and he goes, you know what, Miss Sharon? He goes, it's not fun being mentally ill. He said, it's not a game. And it's not a game. Mm -hmm. This is what people live with. It is very, it can be very, very painful to try to navigate your brain when there's so much going on and so much emotional upheat. It's just a lot. Yeah. And, you know, so we have a lot of these trending things that are going on too, but once again, I think it's because it's people trying to fit in. They're trying to find themselves among all the other yes. chatter that they're being told. And I guess that what people have to realize is that all of it is learning experience. It's not time wasted or things like that. It's it's a process to grow. And so there are things that you have to go through and get a better understanding of to evolve. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that's the thing, too. I think, you know, and I'm going to go back to mental illness. You know, mental illness was one of those things, too. By society, you hid. Nobody wanted to admit that they had a mental illness. You hid it, which only made it worse sometimes. And so I'm really grateful we're having much more of an awareness for mental illness. We're talking more about a mental illness. We have a lot of public figures, celebrities, whatever, that are coming out with their mental illness, which in doing so is saying it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter who you are. Mental illness can happen and we've got to stop hiding it. But at the same time, understanding it's not saying because we're not hiding it to go and want to have it either. That's not what that is. It's not about fitting in in that way. So we have to be careful how we educate and do all these things, you know, and really be consciously aware of how we are talking about things and how consciously we aware we are about talking to kids about things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's somehow it seems like that sometimes people start to identify with that diagnosis so much that it's like that's what becomes the display of who they are. But just because there is a diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't ways that you can cope with things and learn to deal and be very successful and be very successful. Well, and I think that's what it is. And, you know, I often talk with, uh, especially my, with all my clients though, about labeling because labeling puts you in a box. And once you're in a box, it's really hard to get out of a box. And, and I had this one young girl a few years back come into my office and we're, I'm just getting ready to do the assessment. And I say, you know, I introduce myself and she goes, I'm bisexual. And she started talking to me. I said, sweetie, I just need your name to start with. <laughs> you know, I'm sort of like, this is this. And I asked her, I said, why was it about talking about this? She goes, well, I feel like it's part of, like I should. She goes, I don't really know. She was really confused by it herself. And so we sat and we had a conversation about that. Once again, I tell people we're not a label. Right. We, we are so much more. Don't have to put ourselves in a box. I mean, just because it's one part of who you are. It's not all of who you are. And I think that's that thing when we're trying to navigate that difference that we might feel in ourselves is we focus so much on that difference. We forget all the similarities we have. We forget that even though you fall in, whether it's non-neurotypical gender, sexuality, you know, physical differences, whatever that is color differences, it could be academic, the list goes on and on and on. (laughs) 
of why we can feel different in those. And I do feel like nowadays there are, there's a lot of pressure to label. And labels are a way in which we try to figure out. So it's not that they're negative. It's not a negative. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is it's when you use the label to help identify who you are, but don't become the label. Say you can sit there and say, okay, I'm a female. I'm a professional. I'm married. I have children. I'm a mom. I'm a... Do you see what I mean? Those are all labels. But you don't sit there and identify as one and one does not become so predominant and we get stuck in it. That it negates everything else because yes. we are multifaceted. Absolutely. And I think when we start to realize that we are multifaceted, we are going to feel less weird or less different than others. When we realize that it is not those single things that make us not included it's what we're identifying. It's it's that focal point. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the things that we have more in common with people? And once again, when we look at that, the commonalities are so much more prevalent. Right. And once again, I'm not saying that labels don't exist and they're not there for a reason, but it's when we become the label mm -hmm. and we are not able to get out of the label. People should not be saying, Oh, you know, my name is Sharon and I'm bipolar or my name is Sharon and I'm lesbian or my name is Sharon. And I'm transgender or my name is Sharon and I'm a Latina. No, some of those things are going to be obvious. Right. <laughs> but when, but if we have too much of a buy into them, that I think is somebody trying to be, I think we're trying so hard to feel like we belong that we're, that that's where those labels and stuff come in because we identify with those groups. And when we identify with a group, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think the thing is, is because we want role models. So when we look at even in the LBGTQ plus community, they're starting to be more role models. You're starting to see people in same sex relationships that are public figures that have been in these for a long period of time. So it's breaking that old mentality that used the old society thing was, is that they didn't have long relationships. They were bouncing from person to person. It was more about the sexual relationships, blah, 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 all that stuff. Right. That was, that's a little my time, you <laughs> know, back in the day. And, you know, now fast forward, we're seeing those relationships that are long lasting. We're seeing them have children and parenting and having that nuclear family system. Right. And more acceptance. So we're evolving people. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing. But we evolve only through awareness. Right. And we, I don't, I just think that, you know, we shouldn't just be identifying ourselves, defining ourselves through such a narrow scope. We are so much, so much more. And because we are so much more, we can feel like we belong even in more places. Right. And that's what's hard. But once again, we have to sit there and say, who am I? What are my likes? What are my interests? All of those things make up that collective of who we are. Right. Not just who we love, not just our gender and that or, or the way our brain works or whatever, but there's so much more. And even with my, the people I work with who are non-neurotypical, but what are your likes? What are some of the things that you're willing to learn? What are topics that you haven't talked about that you might find interesting? That's sometimes a tough one because <laughs> <laughs> they fixate and that's okay. Even if that's the case, then I just sit there and listen. I learned so much. I really, really do. Once again, I'm not a gamer, but I will sit there and for that time they're in my office. That's all that matters. I'm in that moment with them. And if they're talking about whatever game they're playing and watching them, the animation in them, that's what's important. It doesn't mean I have to understand the game or anything like that. It means how do we be respectful in being respectful and gaining that awareness then we can become a part of that thing of helping people to not feel like they are so different. They don't belong. Right. What do we do too? Because we have to remember at one time in our life, if at one point in our life, we felt like we were the different one, what that felt like to us. And to go back and remember that and remember if it was one person or whoever it was that helped you feel like you belonged. And for me, it was... My classmates in my program at CSU that embraced me and we, we, we developed these friendships. 
And from that moment, it's like, oh, yeah, it was okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what it becomes, that one person that reaches out to you. So being that person for someone else, you know, being aware of your responses. And being aware that at some point you may have been that person who felt different. Right. Who didn't feel like you belonged or whatever that is. We help people navigate the world through our kindness. Compassion. And being attentive. Yeah. To doing things with intention. Right. To have intention to help people navigate when they're unable to navigate on their own. Being that person that offers that support. And if you're that person who feels different or doesn't feel like you belong, reach out to somebody to see if that person, organization, whatever it is, can help you to navigate that feeling of difference. Because once again, at some point, we may have all encountered that to a small degree or a large degree. But doing things with intention, and we talk a lot about intention, mm -hmm. even like with you, you know, with, you know, finding your voice again, you've, you also had to do stuff with intention. You had to switch something in your head. Exactly. But what made you decide to do it, though? You know how much I enjoy, like, I go back to the example of performing the national anthem because that was such a big step for me. But you know how much I enjoy singing. and Every day, people. <laughs> Every day in our home, there's music on and there's Christy singing, which I totally love and appreciate. <laughs> well, doing that, it brings me joy. And so that was one of the things that spurred me to do it was that I felt like I wanted to overcome the fear more than anything because I wanted to participate in something I enjoy so much. And I think that when you can find that thing that you're really passionate about, start there. You know what I mean? Because then it bubbles over into other aspects of your life. But I feel like that, you know, start with the thing that you love doing so much and crossing that bridge to make it happen, to, to take that step. And then you start to feel, you feel the magic that comes with stepping outside that comfort zone and actually making it happen. And once again, I thought, oh, it's really cool is we had so much support from our friends and family, you know, that went there and, and really came through for you. And I thought that was just really amazing because once again, it's the people that are on the journey with this as well. And and that they did it with intention. They let you know it's because we're here for you. This is something monumental for you. And we're going to be here for you. Yeah, exactly. And once again, having that. And I think for you even, because oftentimes we have that self-doubt, even we might feel confident. And then our confidence wanes. Go, You know, it kind of goes back and forth. And I think that's what we see with people when they feel like they don't fit in or they're different. They feel like okay, I got this. And then that self-doubt comes back in mm -hmm. and then they go back. And and so I think it's one of those things that it takes a little bit of time to, to navigate. And once again, I think we navigate it faster when we have those people around us who support us, even if they don't understand it. Right. It's not a matter of you have to understand it. It's just a matter of being there, being present and everybody holding space for each other while we wrap our heads around things and around new ideas or whatever that is and and really just being open to things mm -hmm. it's definitely a process and like it, it kind of you ebb and flow with it and even when you come across those people who you think oh wow you know and if you think they're odd chances are most people who've come in contact with them think they're odd <laughs> but taking the moment if you feel that saying hello doing something mm -hmm. I always think to myself i just wish with my one kiddo, I, I just wish there would be that one student who would go up to him and just say, hello, what are you doing? He eats lunch alone every day. And he has, well, not every day because he did have a friend, but then that anyway, that's a whole other story. But <laughs> to be that one person that reaches out to those people who you can see are not feeling like they're a part of something. And whether you're in schools or out of schools and Oftentimes you have those teachers and another shout out to teachers because oftentimes you will have those teachers 
who will see that and will identify those kids and they'll go above and beyond. Yeah. And I have to give a shout out to a really dear friend of mine, Diana Rice. And the reason I'm going to do this and half the time I don't even like her. (laughs) It's a little running joke with this. (laughs) What I love about this woman is she works in the school systems. She is so loved. And the reason she is loved is because she treats all those kids with the same intensity of love and they know it and nobody in her presence is ever going to feel like they do not belong. She has done this. I admire this about her and I wish her well right now. She is fighting um, some health stuff. I wish her well because she is such a contribution to the school she was in that she's in and the school she was in when Well, I've known her in both schools, and that contribution is outstanding. I really, really enjoyed that. She's a librarian. Just fantastic work with her. The other one, a shout-out to Tim Jaramillo and uh, his wife, Rita. They're in the school systems. I watched him care for kids who were disadvantaged. I watched them. They opened their homes to kids. They saw that in kids who didn't always fit in, and it became a goal of ours to help kids fit in, help they feel like they belonged, and they're still going at it in school systems, and they've been doing it for a very long time, but they see that they become a part of the solution. Right, and they perform hard jobs, but they they do. They have that pure intention to help those kids to feel accepted. You feel it with them. You know it with them. You know that they are there. And you know that there's going to be no difference in how they treat you. And I think for kids to have those things, to have those people in your lives are so important. And so teachers, you do that. You provide that. And once again, always a shout out to that. And also to mental health therapists, because I think sometimes we're, we're really are not given the credit that we deserve because we do a hard job, but we really work on helping people to feel like they're a part of and that they belong regardless of whatever's going on in their lives. And so there are people that do it and there's other organizations. And that's what I say, get involved in organizations, all the stuff that we do, but become an active I challenge people to become active in that to help people to feel like they belong in the, and like they're not so different that they can't have friends and, and have relationships and have careers and all of those other things that are relevant and important to them just as it's relevant and important to us. Mm-hmm. And remember that one time that you felt different and that person that helped you out and, and then that started you on your path as well. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful to all those people who've, come in and out of our lives and who are still in our lives that continue to help us to to still contribute to our successes and just everything. I mean, because they are so supportive. And making us feel like we belong and that we are not viewed as too weird. (laughs) Though it depends on the day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today and If any time we can make a difference on any level, then we've done well. You know what I mean? It's been a good day. Yeah. So have a really great week and we look forward to next week. Bye. Bye.